Today, it's the biggest workplace hazard, according to the World Health Organization, that is, long working hours can be deadly. How type 2 diabetes might be reversible without drugs, as well as the other conditions that often come with it. Also on diabetes, could a new class of drugs slash the number of people with diabetes who go on to need dialysis or kidney transplants? And this week's COVID-19 crisis, where the largest outbreak is in Greater Sydney and has spread to WA in Victoria. Sydney and surrounds have been in lockdown since Friday as contact tracers try to get ahead of the community spread. Around the nation, authorities are trying to stamp out smaller, separate outbreaks before the virus takes off as in New South Wales. Ian Marshner is Professor of Biostatistics at the University of Sydney and specialises in infectious disease modelling. He says the Delta virus was in an exponential growth phase before the city was locked down and things are almost certain to get worse before they get better. So what does the modelling say about this Delta variant versus the previous variants? Well, the first thing to say is that it's very early on, so it is hard to do very accurate modelling. But what we can say is that the early indications are that the rate of increase is certainly steeper than what we were seeing with the introduction of the Alpha variant in in 2020, probably on the order of 50% greater. What that means is that people will get infected more quickly and outbreaks will be bigger and they'll take longer to get under control. And so therefore, locking down early from an epidemiological perspective is always the best strategy in terms of keeping the cluster as small as possible. So last year, the mod- your modelling group worked out what the effect of delay was. Can you just describe what that, you know, the effects of delay? Yes, so last year we modelled the effect of a delay on the increase in the number of infections and found that for each one week of delay in bringing in lockdown conditions, we would multiply the final number infected by fivefold. So with the Delta variant being even more infectious, we can expect that multiple to be even greater than five. And so what does that mean in terms of the current outbreak? Well, what it means is that we can expect more infections and then potentially a longer period to bring it under control. But remember, we have moved much more quickly in this cluster than we did early on in the outbreak in 2020. That doesn't mean we couldn't have moved quicker. We probably could have in this case, but we're much earlier in the process this time than we were in 2020. Will two weeks be enough? It's plausible that two weeks will be enough. It's also plausible that it won't be enough. And what we really have to do in this first week is expect further cases to come out of the woodwork as undiagnosed people become infected and to revisit at the end of this week, essentially, to see how we're going with suppressing the outbreak and whether there would be a need of an extension. What are the key variables that that are in play here? Well, the key variables essentially are the infectiousness and how much people are mixing. So obviously with a lockdown, we've put the stopper on one aspect of that infectiousness. And really, from my perspective, the the really high priority at this point is to be thinking about aged care and the elderly, because that's where the potential is for the greatest burden if we do have a mishap and it gets into aged care. What about time from infection to being contagious? And what do we know about that? There was initially some suggestion that the incubation period was shorter for this Delta variant. My understanding is that 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 may not be the case, but certainly that delay is pivotal in terms of how many people get infected from an infected individual. But that's something that we've been dealing with all along that hasn't changed with this outbreak. And it's the reason why cases will continue to rise after we have the lockdown. I've got Damien Purcell on, who's a virologist at the Doherty Institute, who's quoting evidence to us that the sort of fairly recent evidence that the asymptomatic period with this virus may be longer. If that's true, what's the implication of that for for the modelling? If the asymptomatic period is longer, then you will essentially have a longer time for an infected individual to infect others. And although we've got a strict lockdown, there is nonetheless a small amount of mixing that is continuing. So a longer asymptomatic period would not be a good thing if that's actually true. Can you explain exponential growth to us? So exponential growth is all about multiplying the case numbers rather than adding to the case numbers. So each day we're multiplying the case numbers by a number, let's say doubling, 
So we're going from 2 to 4 to 8 to 16. And it very quickly gets out of control. In fact, it's quite unintuitive how quickly exponential growth can get out of control. So do you think that we're in exponential growth right now? We were in exponential growth, I believe, prior to the lockdown. And it seemed that that exponential growth seemed to be at a higher rate than what we were experiencing with the introduction of COVID last year. And the intention with the lockdown is to put the stops on that exponential growth and bend the curve over, which is what we need to look at in the coming days. Professor of Biostatistics at the University of Sydney, Ian Marshner. This is Iron's Health Report with me, Norman Swan. It wasn't too long ago that researchers in the UK challenged the convention that type 2 diabetes, that's diabetes that comes on in adulthood, is a lifelong condition that's irreversible. Using a weight loss program, they showed for some that the diagnosis can be shelved. Now those researchers have found even more encouraging signs. The high blood pressure that often goes along with type 2 diabetes may be helped as well, with some people no longer needing medication. Here in Australia, experts have taken notice with the very low calorie program now being used in Sydney as well as in remote communities where people are at even greater risk. Sarah Sedgi has the story. A lot of us are at risk of type 2 diabetes. Worldwide, rates are rising and in some communities, people are at a much higher risk. Getting a remission of diabetes, being, being able to say to a patient, you're no longer diabetic, is a really big deal. Approximately a half of our patients were able to get to that point at one year, and about a third of them were still there at two years. And hypertension is another big killing disease, which we shouldn't ignore. About a third of our patients were able to stop their blood pressure tablets and stayed off them for at least two years. That's Mike Lean, a professor of human nutrition and a physician from the University of Glasgow. He's one of the researchers behind a low-calorie weight management program, which I'll get to shortly. It's something doctors here in Australia are hoping can make a difference to the health of people living with type 2 diabetes. In the Northern Territory, GP Dr Sam Hurd sees the harm it causes in the community. In some places, up to 40% of the population is affected. Dire might be a good word. You know, the outcome for people getting diabetes when you're 40 is not good and when you're very young, it's terrible. And diabetes is one consequence. High blood pressure, liver problems, kidney failure, all this is tied in together. So I would put down a fair bit of the gap in Aboriginal health and in the gap in poverty in Australia generally uh, in this category. Dr Hurd is the medical director at the Central Australian Aboriginal Congress. We have you know, massive numbers of people on dialysis in Central Australia. Heart disease is more common, high blood pressure. If you tell a, an Aboriginal person that they've got diabetes, they're pretty devastated and there's stigma involved. It's a really major disease that has implications for everybody, their family, their children. Since last year, he's been working with people in the community to trial this low-calorie program. So we're trying to keep five going at once just during these early days, and all of those have managed to stay on it and are very, very positive about it. Uh, one 40-year-old fella, you know, describing to a large group of Aboriginal people at a meeting, kind of got a standing ovation. And they could see the difference in his whole demeanour and how much weight he'd lost. You know, some people have lost nearly 30 kilograms. We have huge demand now to make this available more widely. The program was developed by researchers at the University of Glasgow and Newcastle. Its trial in the UK recruited around 300 people. About half of those were put on the program under the supervision of their GP, the intervention group, while the control group were looked after through current best practice guidelines for type 2 diabetes. They'd all been diagnosed in the six years prior, and it's important to note that not everyone with type 2 diabetes was an eligible candidate, including those on insulin and medication for certain conditions. Those on the program had calories restricted to about 830 a day, to avoid nutritional deficiencies, participants had nutritionally complete soups and shakes. The aim was to induce weight loss of around 15 kilos during the three-month program. Back in 2017, it was reported about half of those on the program achieved remission of diabetes, compared to 4% in the control group. The latest findings of this study show that blood pressure also came down. Some no longer need the medications they used to take to manage their high blood pressure, Kathleen Brough from Northern England decided to join the trial five years ago. At the time, she had type 2 diabetes, 
and is often the case, also had high blood pressure as well as raised cholesterol. I knew I had to do something about it. I was closely monitored and uh, having my weight, blood pressure and waist measurements taken. And I was pleased to see that as the, the weeks were going on, everything seemed to be going in the right direction. Kathleen lost weight, her BMI fell to the healthy range and her blood pressure stabilised. And something even more remarkable happened. Five years later, and I'm in remission, I think I've done quite well, really, even if I say so myself. <laughs> I was able to stay off the blood pressure tablets up until last year. And then and I was introduced to the lowest dose of uh, Ramipril. Um, but it's still a major, you know, much better than what I was on. And I'm in remission as well with the diabetes. Professor Mike Lean says losing significant amounts of weight improved the health of the participants. A third of our patients had significant fatty liver. Now, fatty liver disease is another manifestation of the metabolic syndrome. It's this constellation of type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, fatty liver, premature heart disease. And it looks like all those conditions get better quite dramatically with this 15 kilograms of weight loss. And the direct trial, one of the other things we did in it was to measure the fat in the liver and in the pancreas using magnetic resonance uh, imaging. And we were able to show that when people start off as type 2 diabetes, they've got a lot of fat in the wrong places. They've got fat in the liver, they've got fat in the pancreas, they've got fat in their heart, and it's damaging the organs. Those who are able to lose that 15 or 20 kilograms and keep it off lost all that excess fat. And the organs, the liver, the pancreas, the heart all seem to function better. But losing weight is tough and something many people struggle with. So why did this work? Professor Lean puts it down to the support patients were given. Their blood pressure was monitored closely to ensure those giving up their medication stayed safe. The program was administered under the care of their GP. And when it came to reintroducing foods at the end of the program, they were guided through the transition. But he also says the participants had the will to make positive changes for their health. And it's being treated as seriously as you might consider chemotherapy for a cancer. People maybe, maybe don't fully appreciate what a serious disease type 2 diabetes is. The prognosis is not as good as breast cancer. Here in Australia, Professor of Medicine at Campbelltown Hospital in New South Wales, David Simmons, is seeing patients have the same success through this low-calorie approach. It's very accessible. It's going through primary care, through the GPs. We're finding that it very much does work, and this is very exciting. This would significantly help a large number of people, potentially. The World Health Organisation says global rates of type 2 diabetes increased from 108 million back in 1980 to 422 million in 2014. It's causing premature deaths more and more. Dr Sam Hurd wants to see these latest findings increase the momentum for change in communities everywhere. If you look around the world, this is what's happening to impoverished people wherever they live. And that we need to do something you know, fundamental to our food supply chain and if we're going to have an impact on this. Because our whole country is going down this pathway. That's GP Dr Sam Hurd, Medical Director of the Central Australian Aboriginal Congress, ending Sarah Sedgi's report. And staying with diabetes, renal dialysis costs tens of thousands of dollars per year a year per patient. And as we just heard, the condition it treats, end-stage kidney disease, is commonly caused by diabetes. Now a group of Australian researchers has modelled whether a new class of drugs could stave off end-stage kidney disease, saving lives as well as money. The drugs are called sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors, or SGLTI2 I's for short, and they're a shift away from simply managing blood glucose, which is how diabetes is generally treated now. One of the people looking into this is Professor Jonathan Shaw, a Deputy Director at the Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute. Welcome, Jonathan. Good afternoon. Diabetes treatment, like we said, is usually about managing glucose, but these drugs work a little bit differently. What are they and what do they do? Yeah, so this is a uh, relatively new class of drug. We've been using it now for about seven or, for about seven or eight years. And um, whilst when we first started using them, we thought that they were a sort of a, just an, another option to uh, manage the blood glucose. It turned out that uh, when uh, the trials started coming in, that in addition to lowering glucose, they had this profound effect on heart disease and on kidney disease, uh, something that was quite unexpected, um, but certainly very welcome to see. Um, and it really has changed the way that we think about uh, what drugs to use for what people and what we might be able to achieve with these uh, agents. 
They still do manage your blood sugar though, don't they? So is there still a place for antihypertensive cholesterol lowering drugs in people with diabetes? Uh, absolutely. These, these drugs don't replace um, other things. So it's really important to control blood pressure. It's really important to control cholesterol. It's very important to control blood sugar. But we're now seeing through mechanisms that, to be honest, we don't really understand. Um, we're now seeing that uh, that these drugs have effects beyond all of those things and, and further reduce the risks, particularly of heart failure and also of kidney failure. Right. So why do we need to be looking at drugs at all? I mean, couldn't we be doing more to just prevent people from getting diabetes in the first place with lifestyle interventions and and those sorts of things? Um, we absolutely need to be doing that sort of thing. So there's, there's, there's just no doubt that that's a good thing to do, a valuable thing to do. But whatever we do um, in that space, we're always going to have people who, uh, for whom it doesn't work, um, people who can't make the changes that are required. And, you know, perhaps we've even seen this in the, you know, the COVID vaccine space at the moment. If, if you, you know, if, if you don't back enough horses, um, in, in the race, you, you can get stung um, when, you know, when you run into problems or, or the, the expected limitations of any single strategy. Um, and, and so um, we, we certainly need to do both things. And the other thing about it is that diabetes prevention, and, and this really applies only to type 2 diabetes, but prevention of type 2 diabetes is a great investment in the future. But according to our modelling, it's, it's an investment in the somewhat distant future. And, and that's because in the next 10 years, almost everybody who will develop uh, kidney failure as a result of diabetes has already got diabetes. Uh, they've probably already had diabetes for several years now. So um, the dividends from diabetes prevention uh, certainly won't apply to everybody and definitely are not going to apply, at least for kidney failure, for at least 10 or 15 years. And that's what our modelling showed us. And if we want to um, make an inroad into the uh, increasing numbers of people ending up on, on dialysis and requiring uh, kidney transplants, um, we have to do something else. Right. So it's a diverse portfolio that you're looking at. So the other two, so you looked at the a large lifestyle modification program for diabetes inter- intervention, a sugar tax and widespread use of these SGLT2Is among people with diabetes. What did What sort of results were you seeing at different time increments uh, in your pro- in your projections so what we found was uh, and this you know wasn't a surprise but the, the the drugs work quickly you know within a few years of getting increasing uptake in the numbers of drugs um, we're starting to see um, 20 25 percent reductions in the numbers of people ending up on dialysis now that's of course assuming that um, in, in in the case that we did we assumed that 50 percent or maybe um, even better 75 percent of people who are sort of heading down that track towards kidney problems were getting onto these medications and staying on them um, you know whether that happens in reality is another matter. We were modeling what would happen. Um, When we looked at what would happen with um, uh, the lifestyle intervention, whether that's a sort of a personal individual-based lifestyle intervention or whether it's uh, uh, something like a tax on sugar-sweetened beverages, um, it took 10, 15 years before we started seeing a benefit. Now, what we also saw was that um, after the first um, five to ten years of uh, increasing benefits for the uh, medication use, that started to plateau off as it was sort of somewhat overwhelmed by increasing numbers of people um, with diabetes. And so that really tells us that it has to be a package deal, um, that we need both components of this. We need to treat people who have diabetes and we need to do everything that we can to prevent future people developing type 2 diabetes. Because we are seeing an upward tick in the trajectory of diabetes incidents in Australia. What's the status of these drugs at the moment in terms of uh, who they're approved for? Um, well, at the moment, um, we have these approved, and it's just changed in, in the last few weeks. Um, we're now seeing these approved for use in people with uh, diabetes, with type 2 diabetes, um, and with al- already some degree of uh, kidney dysfunction. 
Unfortunately, at this stage, that is not all backed up by um, Medicare. Um, so for access to these drugs for Medicare at the moment, um, it's only possible for people whose blood sugar control is not good enough. And that really brings us to this sort of paradigm shift that we have. These are drugs that work for preventing uh, kidney failure and also heart failure in people with diabetes and they seem to do that irrespective of their overall blood sugar control but at the moment we're somewhat restricted we can only use them in people whose blood sugar control isn't good enough and that's sort of on the old paradigm of they're just for lowering blood sugar now we know they're just for a lot more than that right uh, watch this space professor jonathan shaw thanks for joining us on the health report tonight thank you Jonathan Shaw is Deputy Director, Clinical and Population Health at Melbourne's Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute. You're listening to The Health Report on RN. The first ever global study of the impact of working hours on health has just been released. Conducted by the World Health Organization and the International Labour Organization, they reviewed data from 194 countries looking particularly at heart disease and stroke. They found that around 500 million people each year are exposed to long working hours, with nearly 800,000 deaths attributable to that and millions of years of healthy life lost to disability due to heart attacks and strokes. And our region may be one of the worst affected. Lead author of the research, Dr Frank Pega, is an epidemiologist and technical officer with the World Health Organization's Department of Environment, Climate Change and Health. And he joins us from Geneva. Welcome to the Health Report, Frank. Good evening. Thank you very much. Before you did this study, what was known about the link between work and heart disease? We always knew that um, from the evidence, from the literature, that there is a strong link between working long hours and having heart disease and stroke. That was clear, but um, we didn't know the extent to which that was the case. So you tell me what you did in this study to expand the knowledge. In the study, we basically um, quantified how much health loss we do have from working long hours, and that here means working 55 hours or more. We conducted a huge um, set of systematic reviews and meta-analyses where we pulled all the available studies together. These were a large number of cohort studies conducted across the world to uh, basically arrive at uh, the exact increased risk for people working long hours to have uh, a deadly heart disease or stroke. And then we combined this information of increased risk with a huge database, a United Nations database that has um, data in it for 154 countries, never used before, several hundred million um, data points in it on the proportion of people working long hours. And then when we combine this, we have a mathematical formula to calculate how many people can actually be attributed to have died from exactly this exposure to long working hours. Long working hours defined as what? Long working hours here really means working 55 hours or more per week on average. And um, that is in line with uh, a number of epidemiological studies that have divided working long hours up in, in this way. And that's normally the highest category. And what did you find and how did it compare to other occupational risks? Because I would have thought that injury would have beaten heart disease and stroke. Right, exactly. This is what um, common knowledge was at this point. But with this study, I would almost dare to call it, um, it's a game changer in the sense that we now know that long working hours actually have a larger attributable burden than any other occupational risk factor, including the one that you mentioned. So we now know that this is basically the most, um, the, the most deadly and, and uh, largest uh, occupational risk factor that has ever been quantified by the World Health Organization and the International Lab Organization. Now, this can get quite complicated because um, Michael Marmot in London has shown that what, he talks about job strain, that it's not just the number of hours you work, it's the, it's the job that you do. And it's quite possible that people who work long hours in jobs where they've got a lot of control, where they're not getting chronically stressed, are okay. So there's two questions here. One is, how sure are you that it's cause and effect? And is it job specific or anybody working over 55 hours is at risk? Right. OK, we're very well familiar with uh, Professor um, Sir Michael Marmot's work on job strain. And this is, of course, very closely related to, to our work here. So we worked with about 60 professors from around the world that uh, looked at the evidence for a period of five years, synthesized also what we call mechanistic evidence. So what are the actual um, pathways through which we know that long working hours impacts 
health and impacts uh, stroke and leukemic heart disease. And there are two causal pathways that are theorized that actually are aligned with um, the work of, of Professor Mamet and others. One is a direct pathway. So we know, and many of us will know this, who have worked long hours, we know that when we work long hours, there's a psychological stress and physical stress that is exerted. There's a direct pathway between working long hours and then having stress responses that damage tissue in the heart and in the brain and can therefore lead to heart disease and, and stroke. There's also an indirect pathway whereby the people who work long hours may also be engaging in more health detrimental behaviors. And one of these is smoking, but also sleep, right? Sleep deprivation. We know that people working long hours sleep more poorly, and this is in turn a risk factor for cardiovascular disease um, and stroke. So when the scientists evaluated these 60 professors from around the world, what the strength of evidence was for a causal relationship between working long hours and these two health outcomes, they rated it as sufficient evidence for harmfulness, which is the highest rating that can be given in terms of strength of evidence. So I suppose, so this my, response so I suppose <coughs> my question is, is a plastic surgeon earning a couple of million bucks a year, um, working 60 hours a week, filming, you know, operating this and everything else, um, going to be at the same risk as a labourer in, in poverty in Southeast Asia working more than 55 hours a week? Right. So your second, the second part of your previous question that relates to, so do jobs make a difference? So in occupational epidemiology, we divide the world into occupations. People can have different occupations and work in different industrial sectors. And for all of our meta-analyses, we conducted what is called subgroup analyses. So we looked at risk broken down with the data by occupations, by different occupations, such as, um, you know, you call them labor or manager, for example, and also by industrial sector. And surprisingly, we found no difference or no evidence for a difference at this point from the available uh, evidence that we have, right? So in other words, um, the, the, the construction worker, the manager, the teacher, there was no difference to be found uh, in the available evidence at the global level that there are differences in risk. And presumably you controlled for smoking and other unhealthy behaviours so that it was an independent factor. We did control for all of the variables that we could to that are normally controlled in these studies to basically isolate as much as possible the causal effect uh, of working long hours on stroke and on a chemical disease, now we, correct? We know that um, unemployment is very bad for your health as well. Is there a sweet spot in terms of working hours that are good for your health? That's another question. There might indeed be a health benefit from working, uh, you know, a certain uh, lower number of hours, but that does not seem to be the case from what we've seen. But we haven't done a systematic review that looks at uh, sort of underwork, right, as opposed to overwork. So people working less than standard hours. Standard hours we defined uh, according to legislation as 35 to 40 hours per week. So it might be that there is um, a negative or positive health effect from working less than these standard hours. You're quite right, but this was not what our study looked at. Fascinating. Frank Pega, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Dr. Frank Pega, who works at the World Health Organization. Fascinating research there, Tegan. Really important, the role of work. I feel like stroke and uh, heart disease has been a recurring theme this week as well, Norman. Mm, just maybe, just maybe. We've got a mailbag, haven't we? We sure do, and no surprise to anyone who lives in Australia at the moment that a lot of the questions tonight are about COVID, and we'll get to that in a second. But the first one is from Don, who's been advised to take low-dose aspirin because it reduces the risk of developing solid tumours. Don's also seen that aspirin also triggers the production of more stable versions of uh, resolvins, which help the body to switch off inflammation. But Don has heard that aspirin is either useless or risky unless you've recently had a thrombosis. So... Sort him out, Norman. What's our current understanding on the benefits and otherwise of aspirin? Well, low-dose, let's start with cancer. Low-dose aspirin probably reduces the risk of cancer overall, but it certainly re reduces the risk, and we're going to cover this on next week's, um, to some extent, on next week's health report. If you've got polyps, um, pre -cancer, particularly precancerous polyps on colonoscopy, if you go on low-dose aspirin, it's been shown to actually reduce the recurrence of polyps and therefore downstream reduce the, uh, the, the incidence of cancer. So that's a good thing. And it's whether, nobody's really sure whether the influence of aspirin on cancer is just because of its effect on bowel cancer or there is a little bit of evidence about breast cancer as well. Um, 
a lot of this isn't as hugely researched as it should be. Now, when it comes to preventing heart disease, the use of aspirin, just if you've got risk factors, for example, high blood pressure, diabetes, or um, high cholesterol, aspirin doesn't work. Aspirin only works when you've had some damage. So, so in a sense, Don is right. If you had recently had a thrombosis, it's if you've had symptoms or signs of coronary heart disease. So in other words, you've got angina, you've had a stent, you've had a heart attack, and you've had a transient ischemic attack, a TIA, or you've had a stroke. In other words, you've already had the damage. Aspirin can come in and prevent part of the thrombosis. It's been shown, for example, after a heart attack, if you take a low dose of aspirin, you can reduce the risk of a second heart attack by up to 20%. So it's a really effective and very cheap drug. That's the kind of current understanding, natural resolvens. That's beyond my pay scale at the moment. I could come <laughs> back to you on that one. And a Dorothy Dixit from me, Norman, because we're about to get into some COVID questions. And we both know from our other podcast, Coronacast, that lots of people have been asking this. Is there any point in taking aspirin if you're worried about the risk of blood clots from the AstraZeneca vaccine? The answer is no. Hematologists strongly recommend against that. If you're already on low-dose aspirin, for heart disease, for one of the reasons we've just said, stay on it. And the reason that it, this is a safer situation than somebody starting aspirin, if you're going to get a hemorrhage or problems with aspirin, you tend to get it in the first few months after you start it. It seems to stabilise after that in terms of the risk of bleeding. And so if you start aspirin um, after the Astra vaccine in the hope that you prevent the clotting syndrome, first of all, it won't prevent the clotting syndrome because it's an immune problem, not a clotting problem. And secondly, what happens with the immune problem with the Astra vaccine, which is very rare, is that the number of platelets in your blood go down. So there's a paradox here. Not only do you get an increased risk of clotting, you get an increased risk of hemorrhage because you need your platelets to actually cause your blood to clot. And so aspirin will further disable your platelets. So it's not a good idea. And this question comes from Duncan saying, would we know more about our COVID future through numbers of hospitalisations rather than numbers of new cases? Duncan says he knows there's a time lag between those two sets of data, but it seems the limits on us handling COVID are in our hospital capacities, not our number of cases. Well, what do you think about that, Tegan? It's a different, it's an interesting one because I think that there's an ideological difference between the way Australia is handling COVID where it doesn't want any spread at all and the way other countries are handling it where they're keeping it to a number of cases that the hospital system can cope with. So I think it would be a useful thing to know, but I don't know if it's as relevant in Australia as it is overseas. Um, yeah, I, look, I agree, except that one thing that Duncan has said there, could it, we know more about our COVID future? And if you're looking at our COVID future, then we could get to a point where we've got 80, 90% of people vaccinated. As we know, the current vaccines are not you know, not 100%, far from 100% actually, preventing infections themselves. So the key question is, if we're very highly vaccinated, um, that means that we're very highly protected against hospitalizations and deaths. And therefore, it may well be that the metric that's worth looking at as we move forward is, is it a worry if COVID-19, come, the virus comes into the country, if nobody comes to any harm, in which case we can start relaxing and like the flu, allow it in as long as we're covered by immunisation. So in terms of our COVID future, it may well be pretty, a pretty good metric. It's, there's got to be come a time where Australia flips to looking at that as a metric rather than just cases, because at some stage we're going to have to open up and we're going to have more COVID then than we've ever had so far because we've had hardly any so far. That's right. It's just got to be able to come in and not do any harm. Exactly. And so Andrew's asking about contact tracing. Andrew keeps hearing about how, quote unquote, brilliant New South Wales contact tracers are. And he's also heard that New Sa that the Victorian contact tracers are not as good, in quotation marks also. Andrew wants to know more about contact tracing. What goes into it? What makes one contact tracing organisation better than another? Um, well, I don't think that you can say any longer that Victorian contact tracers are not as good. That's a phenomenon of about a year ago when the second wave occurred and the contact tracing organisation was just not up to it. It's not that the individual contact tracers were bad. It's the system in which they worked was not that good. And then you didn't have the public health teams on the ground distributed throughout Victoria. That's all changed. And so I think you, what you saw in the, particularly the last outbreak in Victoria, the contact tracers in Victoria are very, very good. There's probably not much difference between uh, daylight between New South Wales and Victoria or indeed most other states. So they're pretty good. The Northern Territory isn't, isn't match fit, so we'll see how that goes. 
those. And it's just hard work. It's um, use, using sometimes computerized customer relations management systems. So the sort of things that, that commerce use to actually track customers, know where they are, what, what they're doing and so on, and, and tracking them through some established uh, what are called CRM programs or adapted ones. They sometimes use whiteboards to, to track tracers. It's a lot of phoning and interviewing and spending a lot of time on the phone finding out where people are, cross-checking it with the QR codes. It's just bloody hard work. And when each contact that they have has 10 further contacts, it's an enormous task which can soon run away from them. But it's systematic, well-controlled, monitored, observed, um, and, and, and indeed with a lot of teamwork. It, it, it is about a team and it's about a system that, um, that supports the, co- the hard work of the contact tracers. So it's- another, another shameless spruik for our Coronacast podcast. Back in October last year, we interviewed Rainer McIntyre from the Kirby Institute who lifted the lid a little bit on what the ins and outs of contact tracing are. If you're interested in listening to that, you can go back to the 15th of October 2020, which feels like a lifetime ago. It does. Yesterday feels like a lifetime ago. <laughs> One last question for you for tonight uh, from Claire Norman. Uh, she says, I'm all for getting the COVID vaccine. I eagerly await mine. However, Claire has a lot of friends who are not getting it because of the infertility risk rumours. Can the vaccines cause infertility? No. Is the short answer to that question. This is like a lot of rumours and um, misunderstandings. There's a, like a core of an issue in here that once upon a time may have had some scientific validity. And it's about the idea that there could be cross-reactivity with something in the placenta cross-reacting with a, something to do with the antibodies that the vaccine generates. There's zero evidence of that, and there's no evidence that it's affecting fertility, fertility at all. And the anti-vax movement has been pushing menstrual problems, and there's really not a lot of good evidence that there are menstrual problems with the vaccines. So the reproductive effect of these vaccines can be assumed to be virtually zero. The thing that I'm really taking comfort in from the luxury of Australia is that literally tens of millions of people globally have received these vaccines now that are getting rolled out in Australia. So when they say that there's not enough, like when people are trying to say that there's not much evidence for or against them, it's just plainly wrong. There is so much evidence and they're being watched so closely. Um, we're really, really lucky to be where we are when we are. Yeah. And with in terms of infertility, if you're going through IVF and you're going through uh, you're trying very hard to get pregnant, and it's hard to predict sometimes when you do get fall pregnant, is that in fact there's a vaccine imperative. You do not want to get COVID-19 if you're pregnant, and you can, you can do badly and the baby can do badly. So it's something you really want to get covered for. Well, it's everything in the mailbag for tonight. But listeners, if you want to ask a question, email us, healthreport at abc.net.au. And we'll see you next week. See you then. You've been listening to an ABC podcast. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.